This is Tom Pellicero with NFL Network. You're listening to Simple Man Sports with Dane Powell. You are now locked into another episode of Simple Man Sports. This is your source for drama-free, no-nonsense sports coverage. I'm your host, Dane Powell, and today I've got a treat for you because I had the chance to sit down with Tom Pelissero from the NFL Network. We talked about what it takes to get to that level of football coverage. We also had a chance to touch on the Vikings, the Packers, and a little bit of Brett Favre. So let's get right into this interview. Welcome in. I'm Dane Powell, and today I have the opportunity to sit down and talk with Tom Pelissero of the NFL Network. He's going to tell us a little bit about his journey getting there. Tom, appreciate you joining me today. Dane, I'm already jealous of you because you have a way better radio and TV voice than I do. So I will try to keep up with you. I'll channel the baritone, but I'll let you, uh, you handle the, the stuff that really sounds good. Well, I, I appreciate that, Tom. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so before we dive in here, um, I heard that there was a little bit of an episode last week in the Pelissero home. Can you tell me what your tactical approach is for removing a rodent from your house? Uh, well, the primary tactical approach is pay someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, the short version of this was uh, I saw a mouse. I was in my office getting ready to do TV. My, my office and my studio that you can see built behind me, none of this stuff is mine. They, they built all this out when they uh, stuck the studio in my basement here. Uh, thank you very much to NFL Network for that. But it's in the basement of my house. And I had the door open over here. And all of a sudden, I just saw out of the corner of my eye, like, I think that's a mouse. We haven't had mice issues here forever. Uh, but then all of a sudden, I'm on the phone with someone. I was actually on the phone talking with an agent. And then I saw the mouse come into the office. It was at that point that I hopped up on the chair because he ran behind some of the cabinetry here. And I was just trying to see the room. OK, I'm just trying to you know, get a better view because I'm thinking he's going to run out. I need to see where he's going. A lot of people saw the photo and video that my wife posted to Twitter, which she took. And I could see her phone like hanging around from the stairwell here uh, around through the corner of the door. Everyone thought I'm scared of the mouse. No, I'm not scared of the mouse. Now, I don't want mice in my house, but I'm simply trying to see as much area as possible to come up with a game plan in order to at least mitigate the issue short term. Now, immediately I called, set up a guy to, to come out here. He came out, did a fantastic job. Uh, we have caught five mice. They have stopped being caught several days ago. So I think that's it. I think at minimum word got around to the rest of the mice. Don't mess with these guys. Uh, but we also had a close call where initially, before someone told me, don't put cheese in the traps, put peanut butter, because then they actually have to step on the trap and then get caught. Uh, I initially was putting cheese in and I came out of my office and saw the cheese was gone. Trap hadn't shut. My four-year-old daughter's there. And I said, oh, the cheese is gone. She goes, yeah. I go, Finley, did you take the cheese? She goes, yeah. And she was happy about it. I said, no, like, look at this. And I used a pencil. I showed how it snapped shut. She started crying. She apologized to my wife, said, I'm sorry for the mouse cheese. I'm sorry for the mouse cheese. That, that just goes to show, I don't know how to catch a toddler or a mouse, but oh. luckily there's people for uh, several hundred dollars who can come plug the hole between your garage and the uh, house and uh, hopefully keep them from coming in here again. Well, I'm glad you got it situated and I'm glad nobody got their, their fingers caught up there neither. Um, so Tom, you graduated from Edina High School and then you went halfway across the country for a communications degree. What made you choose Boston College? Well, first of all, Edina High School in southwest uh, suburban Minneapolis, best known uh, for being the, the city that produced the Hawks in the Mighty Ducks franchise. The Hawks, of course, were the evil team, the rich kids. I was not a rich kid growing up, but I grew up in the suburb that that's what they're, they're best known for. That's why every time somebody who's ever heard of Edina finds out where I'm from, they call me a cake eater. 
I try to explain it doesn't really get me very far, but I grew up in that suburb. Uh, really actually I wanted to potentially, I didn't know if I wanted to go into journalism or go into finance. So I applied to colleges um, in both disciplines. It really came down to the University of Maryland where I would have gone for journalism or Boston College where I went for finance. I took one day of one econ class and immediately approached uh, the, the powers that be and asked about changing my major. I had to wait till the end of my, year, my first year. Was basically told, yeah, you, you, can, you can move over from the business school to the communications because I just, I quickly realized as much as I like you know, math, I like numbers, I like the idea of finance. My grandfather was a banker, was a big influence on me. I knew what I wanted to do very quickly, even though I needed to uh, enroll in a school that didn't have a journalism program to figure it out. Uh, I quickly realized that, you know, what I really wanted to pursue was uh, sports and, and journalism, you know, in some regard. And, you know, a great thing about taking about being a, a comm major at BC was they didn't really again, they didn't have a journalism degree. And so I was just kind of taking all these different classes that had, you know, areas of what I potentially might want to do. I had to get a broad based education because I really couldn't be narrow and focus on anything. So I have a vast education and a bunch of things that don't matter, like editing SVHS tapes. That was a whole semester, one class on editing. If you remember the remember VHS, everyone knows what VHS is. SVHS was this bigger one that had the audio and video on separate channels. It's a completely dead technology now. Took a whole class on Macromedia Flash. None of that stuff, of course, is applicable to what I'm doing now. Um, but I always tell this to people when they're, you know, especially if they're just thinking they want to get into media or sports media in some regard. I'll always say experiment with different media. Try different things, whether it's, and of course, this is, grown exponentially in the past 20 years since I was in college, but between uh, newspapers and radio and television, and now you have podcasting and YouTube and, you know, TikTok and Instagram and all these different delivery platforms, try out different things, see what you like best. For me, that was a process. I mean, I was a, you know, circa 2002, 2003, I was a uh, once a week uh, sports anchor on a community access TV station as part of an internship. And I programmed the on-campus uh, TV network, which was basically me going to the library and pulling tapes. It was a, a Christian themed, because you know, it's a, a Jesuit institution, it was a Christian themed school. So I'm like programming these different movies and documentaries and whatnot. I took documentary filmmaking classes, a whole bunch of different things. Again, I'm not necessarily applying all that now, but it gave me a really good broad base uh, from which to operate. And so even though accidentally I went to BC to answer your question, I went there thinking I wanted to go into finance. Uh, it worked out fairly well, uh, even though I went a different direction. Well, we're glad you settled on sports and you had mentioned uh, internship. And from what I understand, you did a internship with ESPN while you were at Boston College. Now, what impact does an internship like that have on your broadcasting career? Well, my internship at ESPN, and this is, again, I'm, I'm dating myself here, but this is 2002. I worked in uh, the network integration department. And then that also gave me an opportunity to, um, you know, do some different things at ESPN. I mean, I floor directed an episode of SportsCenter. I still, to this day, have no idea why they let me do it. I mean, I was a 21-year-old idiot who had no frame of reference, had never done anything like this. And I think it was uh, John Anderson and it might have been Scott Van Pelt were the were the anchors. I mean, like big time anchors. And he got me being like, OK, go on the break for two minutes. At one point I called out the wrong thing and they just kept the show just kept going like no one was really listening to me anyway. Right. So for all I know, like they were trained, like we're letting an intern do this. Don't listen to them. But like I, I floor directed an hour of Sports Center. It was a really cool experience that I uh, I still think back on, even though, again, I have no idea why they let me do that. Well. You left college, left Boston, went back to Minnesota, and you started working at KFAN 100.3. What made you get into radio? Well, at that point, it was AM 1130 before they made the switch over to FM radio years later. Um, and that was something where, you know, growing up, and KFAN had launched while I was in, I believe, middle school. And, you know, so I like I would listen to it with my dad in the car, you know, especially coming and going from sporting events. We'd go to a ton of Twins games and Tim Rules games, um, you know, the occasional Vikings game. The Wild weren't there yet. Uh, the North Stars left town in, in 1992, which is very traumatic uh, in my you know, youth experience. 
Um, but so I, I grew up kind of listening to um, sports talk radio as well as reading the Star Tribune, you know, reading Sports Illustrated and things like that. And so my sophomore year in college, I was looking for just kind of any internship, like get me in at any level and just let me be around this. And so the thing that popped up, I applied to KFAN and they gave me a promotions internship. Being a promotions intern at a sports talk radio station, at least in 2001, basically entailed showing up like at softball games and giving out t-shirts, driving the huge KFAN truck in a parade while other people throw out t-shirts. Like that was the whole job. Um, what I did, um, you know, my first day there was uh, go to find out who the person was who ran the website and said, can I write for KFAN.com? And they was like, yeah, sure. I mean, in that case, I did get why they let me do it, which was nobody else was doing it. They're like, yeah, whatever, you know, just go, go do it. Remember my first assignment was going and covering a twins, I believe it was twins pirates. And I wrote just a God awful game story. I mean, I had no clue what I was doing. I had done like yearbook and stuff, but I didn't even work for the school paper at BC. So zero idea how to construct a story. And, you know, Frank Toddick, who is the person running the website was like, okay, here's how this actually works. This is all wrong. We're going to rearrange it tonight, but like, let's work on it. And so I did probably a dozen games doing that in addition to doing all the promotions work uh, that I was doing too, like my actual job there. And none of it was paid. It was, you know, just an unpaid internship, come and get experience. I didn't get course credit for it. They just, you know, they had probably a dozen or two dozen interns who were all doing different stuff there. Um, you know, it was free labor for them. And for me, it was extremely valuable experience. Um, you know, that translated in kind of a weird way into, getting a, a, a part-time job at KFAN upon graduation in 2003. And they needed, again, somebody just to write for the website. It was to cover the Vikings primarily. You know, my, my career has kind of been a, a series of jumps between different, uh, different media, but, you know, really that 2003, 2004 experience prior to me going into newspapers set me up for when I came back uh, in 2010 and really did radio on, on more of a full-time basis at 1500 ESPN Twin Cities. We're talking with Tom Pelissero from the NFL Network. Speaking of jumps across different platforms in the media, I know that after you left there, you went and did work for the Eau Claire Leader Telegram and the Green Bay Press Gazette covering the Packers. Now, how does a story like the Brett Favre saga impact a career? Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, at the Eau Claire Leader Telegram, I got to do a little bit of Packers, a little Wisconsin Badgers, but a lot of it was high schools. It was Northwoods League Baseball. It was Division Three College, the UW Eau Claire Blue Golds and the UW Stout. Well, I'm going to be in trouble if I can't. I can't think of even what their mascot was, but basically that, that was like the extent of it. And I actually broke a story there that Green Bay was getting a Northwoods League baseball team because I had developed sources covering the, uh, the Eau Claire Express Northwoods League baseball team. And so somehow I ended up with this story. And so that put me on the radar, actually, the Green Bay Press, because that had nothing to do with me covering the NFL. But then they found out I had covered the NFL in some capacity before. So they brought me on as the, uh, the assistant sports editor. And that was at a, a remarkable time in, in Green Bay history. I was there the 2007 through 2009 seasons. So 2007 with the youngest team in the NFL, Mike McCarthy in the second season as the Packers coach and Brett Favre in his, what ended up being his final season as the Packers quarterback went on this seemingly magical run uh, to the NFC championship game. And they are, you know, a field goal away. They go to overtime in that game. Uh, Favre throws an interception to Corey Webster. The Giants finally, after missing a couple of field goals, they make one, they go on. And then that sets up the saga in the summer of 2008 where Favre retires on my 27th birthday, or excuse me, I was covering the press conference on my 27th birthday with Brett Favre. And then, you know, circa April, May, June, all of a sudden the rumblings start that he wants to come back. And then you have the showdown of sorts, both in June when Favre goes public with Greta Van Susteren on CNN, all the way through first week of August, where Favre flies in amidst a lightning storm on the same night the Packers are having their uh, family night scrimmage. And then that follows with Aaron Rodgers being booed at practice. I'm camped out in a lawn chair looking into the loading dock at Lambeau Field because Favre's in there having this lengthy meeting with Mike McCarthy. 
Uh, it, it was a unique experience for me being, you know, very young on that beat, still not really entirely knowing what I was doing, but seeing a national story that was playing out locally in what is the most unique market in the NFL, Green Bay, Wisconsin, 100,000 people, and they've got one of the biggest brands uh, in all of sports. And then 2010, he gets talked into coming back at a time that I'm making the transition to uh, 1500 ESPN Twin Cities, you know, and seeing that year, which everybody knew, including Favre, that it was probably a bad idea, but he wanted to come back, give it a shot for, for Steve Hutchinson and Jared Allen and, and Ryan Longwell. And he ended up, you know, the most durable player in modern NFL history, ends up leaving several games, one with a, a very scary concussion. Uh, at TCF Bank Stadium, another where he got, I think, his chin cut open with a hit in Foxborough when he got carted off the field. That was the same year Randy Moss came back to Minnesota for 25 days of just pure madness. I mean, that was a that was and that was the same team that had uh, the roof of the Metrodome collapse. Uh, they ended up getting stranded in Philadelphia, played a Tuesday night game because of a snowstorm that never came in Philadelphia. Just a crazy season. All that stuff, I think, just kind of it definitely molds you as a you know, a young and, you know, probably decreasingly uh, young reporter at that time, just, you know, you cover, you think you've seen everything. And then a season like the 2010 season uh, plays out for the Vikings, much like you think you've seen everything. And then 2020 plays out in the NFL in the midst of a pandemic and all the, the challenges that brought. Yeah. You mentioned that you had a lot of crossover there when you, when you went from green Bay to 1500 ESPN twin cities, what was it like covering rival cities like that? Well, you know, it's, it was, I think the proximity is part of it, which in the Midwest, you know, this is not the East Coast where everything's a, a train right away. In the Midwest, there's only so many places you really realistically can drive. Green Bay to Minnesota is one of those places you can drive. And so certainly there's, you know, no love lost between the fans. You have a ton of Packers fans at every home Vikings game against the Packers. You have a decent number of Vikings fans for every home uh, Packers game against the Vikings. I think that's just, a, you know, it definitely gives you both sides of it. I think that that's part of it. But the fact that you had one of the icons in Packers history playing for the Vikings, I think that that just made that that much more interesting. Well, I understand that during all this Brett Favre saga and during your transition from your previous platforms, you were doing a lot of freelance work. Um, so how did freelance work really benefit your career? It, it definitely did tremendously because I just got to, um, you know, work to different standards, I think was one thing. You know, I wrote for the Associated Press, which has really rigorous standards in terms of um, just how things are reported. They want things written a certain way. They want things reported a certain way. Uh, Dave Campbell at the AP, again, took a chance on me at age 23, I think I was, when I started writing for him, you know, covering all kinds of stuff. It started out as doing Fridays at Vikings games, but then it would be things like, Hey, the NCAA championships in swimming are, uh, you know, this week, can you cover two days of swimming? I'm like, yeah, I don't know anything about swimming, but sure. That was big. And, you know, Sports Illustrated, uh, Sean Jensen, who was somebody, uh, along with Kevin Seifert, who were on the Vikings beat when I started out, I got to know both of them. They were both big helps. Um, I wouldn't even call us competitors because they were much, much better than me. Uh, but they would still try to help me out and kind of make me understand how certain things work. And Sean uh, had, you know, was doing freelance work for Sports Illustrated. He passed a couple of assignments my way because he didn't have time to do them. One of which was covering, it was for Sports Illustrated, and it was their new SI players section at the time. So this would have been like 2004, maybe. And my assignment was to go sit in a hotel room with Bryant McKinney, who was the 300 plus pound left tackle for the Vikings, while he was playing Xbox against a player from another team that he knew and like talking on headsets before that was a thing before every kid in America did that. And so like, and I had to write like 500 words off it of which I don't know if any of it even made it into print, but like that was, that was the assignment. I mean, all that stuff helps I mean, putting that on a resume. Uh, definitely, you know, even though like what it actually was had nothing to do with anything. It was just this weird assignment. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it definitely helped. Well, you've actually got a pretty extensive resume and you've jumped around quite a bit um, from USA Today and to Sirius XM and NFL Media. So how do you decide when it's the right time to make a move? Well, I think for me, there's 
you know, there's never been like a clear path. Um, it's been a matter of, and, and this is another thing that I always tell young people when they're getting into the business, which is you need to read a lot, write a lot, figure out what you're good at, experiment with different media, um, take things from people in the industry that you like, don't copy them, but try to apply things like a, like a pass rusher watching other pass rushers. You know, this, this guy's never going to be like Cleo Mack is never going to be like Alden Smith, but he might be able to watch some old Alden Smith tape and say, Hey, I like that move. I wonder if I can kind of adapt that into what I do. It's kind of the same thing when you're trying to start out uh, in media where you're trying to figure out who am I? Then once you find your voice, your, your thing that, you know, that makes you unique because it's a flooded uh, marketplace. I mean, there's thousands of people that want to do um, you want to get into it and want to do right. certain things. It's how do you stand out? And so it's been an evolving process for me where I've not just jumped from, you know, place to place. I've jumped industries, really. I mean, always within media, but to, to completely different uh, areas. And a lot of it's just been about opportunity as well as my evolving idea of what do I do well and, you know, what makes me stand out. So, you know, 05 moving from KFAN to the leader telegram was I think an easy decision. And I had had other opportunities to go to like other small papers and things, but this was one where I'm staying in the upper Midwest. Um, there, everyone is telling me, you know, before I went there, I had interview at, uh, gosh, I can't remember. I, I, I had interviewed or I at least talked to people. I'd been applying to like all these big jobs. I mean, I'm sure I was applying to like, you know, the pine, I applied to the pioneer press. I remember that. And I talked to them. I, I had applied to other places. And everyone was telling me, like, you need to go somewhere and actually write. You've never been on a deadline before. You need to go do that. So I went to the Eau Claire Leader Telegram. I got that experience. But I knew that, okay, I want to get back to covering pro sports. I need to go to a pro sports city. So opportunity arose with the Green Bay Press Gazette. That was the opportunity I've been waiting for. You know, USA Today, that was another difficult uh, decision because I had growth opportunities at 1500 ESPN. But in that, you know, instance, it was a matter of, I thought this is kind of my, you know, my chance to try this nationally to go to, you know, it was a newspaper. It was a departure from um, doing radio and I'd been doing more and more serious XM NFL radio at that point too. But I, you know, thought, okay, this is just one of those ones. I probably can't pass up this opportunity to go try this on a national stage to cover the NFL. So I went there. I uh, was for four years at USA Today, uh, you know, traveled all over the country, had ample opportunities, had a ton of support from a revolving cast of editors that I worked with there. Uh, and then when NFL Network arose again, it was a matter of, you know, how do I kind of push myself here? And, you know, the one frontier that I hadn't really gone to was TV in the media landscape. You know, I had done TV appearances. I had done a ton of online stuff, but I thought, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, how, what are the odds that I'm going to have this opportunity uh, again? And so that was a, that was a relatively easy decision to, uh, to make that move. So, you know, that's That's kind of a step-by-step and that's specific to me. I, I think that it's, it's a matter of though, figuring out like, who am I at this stage of my career and not just always thinking three steps ahead. I think you have to have that in mind at all times, but also just like, what is going to help me develop? What are the skills? Okay. What it makes me unique. How am I going to get better at that? But also, what haven't I done? You know, I, I've always been about trying to challenge myself to kind of see how far I can push this thing. Whatever it is, just figuring out, you know, is there something more I can do? Uh, and that definitely drives my wife nuts at times because I'm always taking on more and, you know, more responsibilities and things like that. But that's just kind of built into my DNA, I guess, of just trying to figure out, you know, what. You know, what, what more can I do? And that's not to say that I'm looking to, to leave NFL Network anytime soon. I mean, this is, this is a really, you know, awesome, um, you know, stage that I'm on and a great place to work. I've got tremendous coworkers. I get to do a lot. Um, you know, we have a lot of different opportunities to do different things. Um, you know, but so for, for me, I think that it's, I think it's specific to every person in terms of, you know, what do you, not just what do you want to do? What do you think you can do? You know, maybe, maybe you have, you know, just kind of this, this very vast idea of I want to, to get here. Well, there may be steps in my case that go over here and then over here and over here, but, you know, always just trying to, you know, kind of work toward the bigger picture, um, you know, which for me ended up being this jagged path that, um, you know, put me where I am right now.
Well, Tom, before we get out of here, let us know where we can find your work on social media or otherwise. Best way to do that is to Google because on first attempt, you're probably not going to spell my name correctly. It is Tom Pellicero. If you're watching the Zoom, I don't know if the name comes up, then that might help. But Google Tom Pellicero. That's generally that's my name on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. They haven't gotten me on TikTok yet. I imagine that's like a year or so away. I'm going to have to do it. I, I know I've like reached that point now. I've got a six year old and a four year old daughter. And they're already saying things to me like technologically or, hey, I watched this show or we got to get this app on the TV. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I've already like I, I remember being a kid and having my dad be like that. They've already they're already kind of lapping me on that. But so I'm on the basics. Twitter is where is where I spend uh, the majority of my time. All right. Well, Tom, I appreciate you taking some time to sit down with me today. Absolutely, Dane. Best of luck uh, to you as well. Thank you. That was Tom Pellicero of the NFL Network. Man, what an awesome interview. Big shout out to Tom Pellicero. I appreciate you sitting down to take some time to talk with me. This is Simple Man Sports. We are your source for drama-free, no-nonsense sports coverage. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find all of our full content on YouTube. Just make sure that you go ahead and click that subscribe button. You can also find us on simplemansports.com. I'm your host, Dane Powell, reminding you to make sure you take some time to check on a veteran, and y'all stay simple. Simple.